Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We'll be starting very soon. Please be aware that this entire presentation will be broadcast on the internet, including the question and answer sections. Please take your seats. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin. Please silence your cell phones. And as a reminder, our event is being broadcast live on the internet. Please welcome Indian Rocks Mayor Cookie Kennedy. Hi, everyone. We welcome you to our Red Tide Summit. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us on this very important issue. I tried to get around to talk to as many of you as I could, and I really appreciate that you're here. Tonight, the city of Indian Rocks Beach and Pinellas County are the hosts of this discussion. Our partner, Russ Kimball, with the Sheraton Sand Key, graciously invited us to hold the summit at his hotel. Russ, Dara, and staff from the Sheraton, a very special shout out, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. I'd like to... Russ Kimball really is awesome. I can't say enough great things about him and what he's done for Pinellas County. I'd like to acknowledge the staff of Congressman Christ. Stand, if you will. Okay. Senator Scott, Scott Staff. Sorry. Representative Webb. DeSeglia. I don't know if they're here yet. Bill Arrakis. <laughs> Senator Brandis. All of the elected officials who are here tonight, please stand, if you will. From Pinellas County, our county commissioners, Pat Gerard, David Edgers, Janet Long, our county administrator, Barry Burton, please stand, just so everyone can see that you're here with us tonight. <laughs> I want you to know, as an elected official in a small town that was deeply affected by the red tide, how much we appreciate Pinellas County and how exceptional their response was to our communities during the red tide. We love you guys. One example of their approach, a very proactive approach from our county, was the mobilization of fish and shrimp boats to skim the gulf and remove the fish kill left by left and one of our panelists, Kelly Levy, who is the director of Envir environmental management and her staff, the process conceived and used for the first time anywhere in Pinellas County. Shout out. <laughs> Tonight is an open classroom. What happens with Red Tide and how we as a community can take steps to do our part, learning and sharing information. I guarantee you will walk away more informed from our presenters. I'd like to take a moment and express gratitude and appreciation to our panelists, Dr. Kate Hubbard, Dr. Robert Weisberg, Dr. Barb Kirkpatrick, Dr. Richard Stump, Brittany Barbara, Greg Mims, City Manager of Indian Rocks Beach, again, Kelly Levy, Kurt Foster, Randy DeShadow, Zao, said it wrong. Um, each of you serves a greater public good and directly impacts the lives of others through your research, analysis, and the desire to positively impact our world. The effects of red tide are many. Small businesses suffer. Residents suffer. Cities, tourism, and wildlife suffer, and our health. I am asked over and over again 
Is there really anything that we can do? So let's find out. We have a packed agenda. After the first four panelists, we will open up to questions from the audience. At the end of the last presentation, additional questions may be asked before closing of this event. Now give a round of applause for our panelists, and let's begin our discussion with Dr. Kate Hubbard from the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Thank you so much for that introduction. So I wanted to start out today with a bunch of thank yous and I will be talking about FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Red Tide Research and Monitoring Program. I thought a great way to highlight what we do is to talk about the 2017 to 2019 Carinia Brevis or Red Tide event. I wanted to start out by thanking all of you, um, as well as the summit organizers, and a number of partners, some of those you see up here, um, and you'll hear from them today, and I've also included some of them on this first slide. And I would re be remiss if I didn't thank the counties, as well as citizens. Um, we have a very active citizen volunteer monitoring program. So I wanted to start out and just introduce the red tide organism, Carinia brevis. You can see this dinoflagellate swimming around. This is a microscopic alga. It um, divides in the environment. You can see it moving here through two flagella. This particular type of alga produces brevitoxins. These are neurotoxins. Um, not all algae are bad. And so before I go any further, I want everyone to take two deep breaths with me. Okay, so for one of those breaths, you can actually think a marine alga. These tiny cells are able to photosynthesize. They have chlorophyll, just like land plants, so they can take up carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen. They produce roughly half the air we breathe. Um, so only a handful of these different algae species are known to be toxic or problematic. Um, so unfortunately, Karenia brevis is one of those. It does occur each year in the Gulf of Mexico and southwest Florida. And we've been tracking these blooms for a long time. Um, so our careful records go back um, to the 1940s, the late 1940s and early 1950s. And so we have fairly decent records of blooms that have occurred since then. However, we know from some of the earliest reports, um, from native reports as well as explorers, that these events have been occurring for a very long time. The 2017 to 2019 bloom was one of the longest on record. It ended up lasting from November of 2017 through uh, February of 2019. So the last event that we had that was comparable in duration was the 2004 to 2007 event. The longest event we've ever had is 30 months, um, and that was in the 90s. You'll hear today about some of the different factors <clears throat> excuse me, that played a role in the persistence of this long bloom. <clears throat> so some of the impacts that this bloom had, and I'm sure that many of you in the room were familiar with these, include um, wildlife impacts. These are related to both toxin exposure um, and in some cases also low dissolved oxygen caused by the bloom. The toxins can kill fish, seabirds, manatees, turtles, and dolphins, and we certainly saw all of those during this past event, and we set some records for some of those animals. We know that red tide through these toxins can also cause human health impacts. Um, we know that bivalves that feed on these red tide cells can concentrate the toxins. If human consumers eat them, they can get a, symptom, a syndrome called neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. So we very carefully monitor our shellfish beds and we work with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to close them when necessary. We also know that these toxins can make it into the air. When these toxins can become aerosolized, they can impact beachgoers, um, and this can be especially problematic during periods of onshore winds. Um, these winds can vary throughout the day, and so you can be at one beach and experience different conditions throughout even a, a single day. 
The long-lasting event that we had coincided with a freshwater blue-green event or cyanobacteria event. Um, I just wanted to point out these algae are different. Um, they look different. They're caused by different organisms. Um, and so that was something um, for the rest of the talk I'll be focusing on red tide. But I did just want to mention that. Um, so we know that red tide initiates offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, approximately 10 to 40 miles out, um, roughly south of the Big Bend region to just south of the greater Tampa Bay region. When conditions are right, typically during the summer, um, cells start to move onshore and then they're transported into the surface. We typically see the blooms manifest in coastal waters. We'll hear a little bit more about that process during Dr. Weisberg's talk. Once those cells make it into the nearshore environment, they're capable of using a diversity of nutrients, and they're also able to thrive across a broad temperature and salinity range. Um, they can't live in freshwater, but they can live in brackish conditions. These are just some of the different nitrogen, uh, excuse me, nutrient sources that Carinia brevis can use. They include both oceanic sources as well as terrestrial sources, natural and man-made. We continue to work with Carinia both in the lab and in the field to help understand the ecology of this organism. You can see an image here. Um, we can grow these cells in the lab, and we're currently growing them at light levels that are comparable to what you might experience in the surface of the ocean. We're now able to do that because we can grow the cells using LEDs. During the bloom, our group processed over 14,000 samples using light microscopy. Um, this is a picture of the lab kind of midway through. We had already squished in a few extra microscopes, and by the end, we had another two microscopes in there. Um, just to give you a sense of how patchy a bloom can be, this is an image taken from Reddington Beach in September, and you can see these very, very different cell concentrations located very close in space. One of the things that we've continued to do, we started to do during this past event, was make sure that our data was available in a more timely fashion. And so you can go to our website um, listed at the top of this page. You can see sample results. These are those cell counts, and this is updated each day. Um, so instead of providing data twice weekly, we're now able to provide it um, each day. This has been a huge uh, advantage, and we've really liked this. I also wanted to mention with this, um, and given our audience, we are located in St. Pete, and we have routine monitoring in the greater Tampa Bay area at 10 beaches and piers. We also do offshore monitoring monthly. Um, so those are two things that we do to help track and identify red tide as it's developing. So if we go back in time to October before the bloom started, um, I'm going to show some maps. These are our cell count data. Each of these sites represents a sample. The color indicates the concentration of cells. The, uh, dark, the red colors indicate high concentrations. So October, not much going on. And then in November, we see that the bloom starts. It starts further south. We continue to have the bloom for several months. Throughout the winter, it persists. It moves north, it moves west, it moves south. Um, but we don't see it go completely out of our system. Um, we see impacts in Florida Bay. Um, we see the bloom continue through the beginning of the wet season, which started early in 2018 and in May. So then fast forward to August, and we see the bloom start to impact this area. Um, so as the southwest bloom continued to worsen, um, I wanted to mention a few different things that we were seeing. So this bloom wasn't occurring just near shore. It was also occurring offshore. You can see even 10 miles offshore, we're seeing very high concentrations. We were able to monitor the inshore bloom using a particular instrument that takes a water sample every 20 minutes and then takes a picture of all the cells in that sample. We were able to see that the cells in the nearshore environment were very happily dividing. At the same time, when we were looking offshore, we saw the presence of another alga, a different type of cyanobacteria, trichodesmium. We were watching this alga at the same time as we were seeing dust move across the Atlantic Ocean into the Gulf of Mexico from the Saharan Desert. 
This, <clears throat> this dust is important to the region because it can help stimulate blooms of trichodesmium. That's this golden alga shown right here. This alga is important because it can pull nitrogen from the air and turn it into other forms that other algae can use. And you can see in this image that we had this trichodesmium in close association with the red tide offshore. We know that subsurface observations are very critical, especially given that the blooms initiate at depth. And so we'll hear today about how some of those observations have been critical for helping us know when and where blooms are likely to occur next. This is just showing subsurface chlorophyll. I mentioned at the beginning that red tide has a pigment, um, chlorophyll, like, like plants. And so we can actually see a sign of that using robots that move up and down in the water when they come up. They send uh, data from sensors that are collecting information about the water column properties back to us on land. And so you can see here, we have subsurface chlorophyll. Um, we suspect that that's red tide. We can go out in a boat, grab a sample. We did, and we found red tide. I'll let uh, Dr. Weisberg talk about the, the greater meaning of that in his presentation. Um, but I did also want to show October. Um, this was a really rough month for a lot of us in the room, um, but also around the state. We see that the bloom at this point is occurring in northwest Florida as well as on the east coast. The last time that we had a bloom in all three of these regions was in 2007. And this is just showing that same data, but now we have the panhandle shown in red, southwest Florida shown in black, and the East Coast shown in blue. To give you a sense for the timing of the event um, and also uh, a sense for when we were really seeing things in all three areas. And you may ask yourself, what do we do with all of this data? Um, well, we, we have a historical monitoring database and so we use that to assess trends in the data, but we also share our data with numerous partners each day. And so that data is automatically transferred and we have tools that we use to predict and track red tide. And you'll hear about some of those from some of our next speakers. Um, people always ask me what kills red tide. And one of the things that kills red tide are grazers like bivalves that feed on it. We have a separate project working with a different type of toxic algae, um, pyridinium, it's shown here. And if you see, we can add shellfish and we're doing experiments to see how quickly this these shellfish can graze on these algae with the idea that we could restore shellfish beds with, as a potential mitigation tool. Um, so I just want to conclude to say that red tide has been occurring for centuries. Education is critical and we have a lot of information about red tide on our website that I didn't get to go into today. Um, you may be asking yourself, what can we do? You'll hear a lot um, from some of our speakers today. And we have different strategies that we're working on to try to improve our resilience, um, as well as our ability to mitigate these blooms. And that can happen through providing early warning, as well as through some of the potential treatment possibilities. Um, and I just wanted to end to say that one thing that everyone can do is if you see something going on, don't hesitate to call it and report it. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that, um, but especially if you see something wildlife related, we have an app, we have numerous numbers, um, so let us know what you see. Thank you. I forgot to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Robert Weisberg. Now I can say thank you, Kate. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do is talk more about Red Tide and try to express what we know, what we don't know, and perhaps what we can do about it. Um, I'm a professor of physical oceanography at the College of Marine Science at USF. I'm not a biologist, and you'll see shortly why red tide really is a fully interdisciplinary problem. Whoops. Well, oh, okay. All right, so what do we know? 
you know, as, as Kate said, red tide is a bloom of a toxic dinoflagellate called Corinia brevis, and it occurs quite naturally. It initiates offshore under oligotrophic conditions. Oligotrophic is a fancy name for very low nutrients. So contrary to some popular opinion, it's not a lot of nutrients that give us a red tide bloom. It's actually a deficit in nutrients that give us a red tide bloom. It manifests as a nuisance at the coastline, that's when we experience it, when it gets transported from the initiation region into the coastal zone. And um, so both the offshore conditions that will allow it to bloom and the transport mechanism is actually determined by the ocean circulation. So again, red tide is not just biology, it's the whole shebang. What don't we know? Well, you know, do humans exacerbate red tide blooms? Perhaps, but we really don't know that. What determines bloom termination? Why does it go away? Kate gave us some possibility, but we really don't fully understand that. And might there be a means for mitigation? Again, we, we really don't know. So what do we do about this? Well, we need more systematic full water column observations. We're starting to do that now, as you'll see, and actually Kate already showed you some of that, but it took a long time to get to that point. Previously, we would start observing when a bloom was sighted at some location, and someone would go out and make a sample, and sure enough, there's red tide. Well, we could have told you that by our nose. Um, it's only more recently that we've really made systematic offshore observations, and a lot more of that is needed over the full water column, not just at the surface. We need to support necessary modeling and the tracking of bloom so that we can better predict where it's going to be. We need to perform laboratory and microcosm mitigation experiments. We don't want to just go out in the water and try something because the results might be disastrous. So we really need controlled experiments on how to perhaps mitigate red tide. And frankly, we need to solve known man-made problems. There are some things that we know we're doing wrong, some things that maybe we're guessing at it, but let's, let's solve the ones we really can solve. All right, so um, to kind of get an appreciation for what this phenomena is, we have to look beyond the coastline. So on the left, hand panel, you see a map of the west of Florida and, and the coastal ocean west of Florida that we call the West Florida Continental Shelf. You can see it's as wide as the state of Florida, and a lot goes on out there. In the right-hand panel, you see a, a white ellipse. We think that's the origination zone for red tide, so where red tide actually originates offshore and the white arrows are the transport pathways to the coastline. All those little red dots are all the places from 1953 to 2015 where FWRI has collected samples and actually identified the existence of Corinia brevis. And you can see that the distribution is very non-uniform. There's an epicenter from north of Tampa Bay to south of Charlotte Harbor, so we call that the epicenter region. By the way, it has nothing to do with Tampa Bay or Charlotte Harbor. There's a reason why it's there. And we see a secondary region on the Panhandle, and now and then you'll see some on the East Coast. So the location of where we see red tidal on the coastline is determined by the ocean circulation. So again, ecology, I like to say, is not biology. It's everything that goes into an organism being successful. And so here in Florida, the reason why we see red tide where we see it is owing to the ocean circulation. That's also the region, by the way, where gag grouper grow up as juveniles. The same reason. That's where they're carried from their spawning region to the settlement region. Okay, so we have to understand the ocean circulation over the entire West Florida shelf to get a handle on red tide. And uh, I'd like to say that the Bard really knew all of this back in the 16th century, long before us, because he wrote, to be oligotrophic or not to be oligotrophic, that is the question. 
Um, so Kate already showed you the slide on the bottom, um, it, and she explained what it is. There's two reasons why 2018 was such a, a bad year. Uh, and it actually probably rivaled 2005 that you may also remember as a terrible red tide year. So two things happened. One, the 2017 bloom just didn't go away. And we don't fully understand why that was. And the offshore conditions in spring through summer of 2018 were conducive for a new bloom to form. So we had the coalescence of an existing 2017 bloom and on top of that, uh, a new bloom forming offshore in 2018. They came together um, and you can see how long that bloom resided and the color coding on the left-hand side shows when cells showed up on the panhandle that was coincident, coincident with Tropical Storm Gordon that drove some of those shell cells northward. And the time when cells showed up on the east coast, which was also due to the circulation. We were in a period of protracted upwelling. Cells near the surface were carried offshore, and then they were carried around the Florida Keys. Once they're in the loop current and the Gulf Stream, it's simply a matter of days before they show up at Palm Beach. So what do we do about that at USF? Well, we have these robotic gliders. They're autonomous vehicles that we can pre-program, send them offshore, they'll sample the full water column and telemeter that data by satellite back to the shore and we can plot it up and see what's out there. And so you see the path that the glider took from the end of, um, uh, August through the middle of, of September, the idea was to map out the region where we thought red tide was forming. And these are the data that we collected. Kate already showed you um, the chlorophyll data in the upper right-hand panel. And you can see where we see Karenia brevis. Um, the left-hand panel on the top is the temperature and it's cold down near the bottom because we were in the midst of an upwelling circulation. And that same upwelling circulation that made the water cold is what carried the red tide into the beach. And this, this is how it, how it went. So we use a, what we call a numerical circulation model. So we can actually model the movement of the water on the West Florida continental shelf. And so every place where we have a red tide observation, or at least the implication from the glider survey, we initialize the model with a particle along the bottom, and we tracked where that particle would end up as it got carried by the ocean currents. And you can see where it went. It all went from North Pinellas County to uh, Charlotte Harbor. And so that's why that region north of Tampa Bay to south of Charlotte Harbor is the epicenter region. If we generate new cells, middle of the continental shelf from say the middle of the Big Bend down to just south of Tampa Bay, those cells will go to the beach uh, from Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor. So um, 2018 pretty much confirmed our previous thoughts on origination and transport, and therefore why the, we experience red tide where we experience it. Once we have a red tide, in collaboration with uh, Kate's group, uh, we do short-term prediction of where that red tide's gonna go. Again, we use a numerical ocean circulation model, which we've gauged against real data, so we know it works pretty good. And um, we, you can go to the internet and call up those figures on a daily basis, click on a specific location, whether it's Tampa Bay or Charlotte Harbor or other locations, and you can get a four and a half day forecast of where those cells are heading on the basis of the ocean circulation. For the Tampa Bay region, we have even a very higher resolution model, which is a lot more accurate for Tampa Bay and the lower right-hand panels kind of show the tracking in, in that model. And since it might be difficult to interpret these, we put out a, a more user-friendly product every Wednesday and Friday, um, which you see in the lower right. 
And so it's color coded. When it's red, it means you probably don't want to go to the beach there. When it's clear, um, you're probably OK. So that's all available publicly on the internet. And uh, so there's my final slide. What's our pathway forward? Predictions require understanding. You're not going to predict anything unless you understand the process. You don't know, you can't fix anything unless you know how it works. And so that understanding requires observations and models. Um, K. Brevis and anything of an ecological nature is an interdisciplinary problem. And so improving K. Brevis capabilities will not be achieved simply by studying the organism. It's a, a fully interdisciplinary uh, problem, and it needs an approach in that matter. Same thing for our fisheries resources. We will never predict our fisheries, manage them better, until we start studying our fisheries in a fully interdisciplinary way. So for observations, we need to have these regular glider surveys. So we need to be going out preferably monthly, but at least quarterly, and mapping out the water properties offshore to determine whether or not they're conducive for a red tide to, to bloom. And, and to de develop the data set to actually get a better understanding for these conditions. The glider surveys must be supplemented by actual cruises. We actually have to collect water, analyze them in the lab like Kate talked about. And we need to have strategically placed moorings. We have the moorings. On them, we need sensors that will actually sense the nutrient state, because that really is the predictor. If we have a ligotrophic water in the right period of time, you'll get a red tide. If you don't, you won't. Simple as that. And that seems to work for 20 out of 25 years. And we need to support our modeling. So um, what determines bloom termination? That's an unknown. If we figure that out, we may have an avenue for mitigation strategies. And, but we have to be mindful that if we got rid of red tide tomorrow, the unintended consequences of that might actually be worse than the bloom. So we have to really be careful about what we do, and we need to better understand how this organism actually fits in the ecosystem of West Florida. So I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, let me introduce Bob Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Bob, and again, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. Good to see a uh, crowd. We're going to change it up a little bit here, and I'm going to be talking about Corinia brevis and human health uh, impacts. And I'm going to form it here in three basic uh, categories, talk quickly about ingestion of the toxin. Again, Kate described it, Bob talked about it, called brevitoxin. If we have chemists in the audience, Google it. It's well described. For the non-chemists in the audience, I'm not going to show any chemistry. How about that? OK? Um, then we'll go, oh, I, I changed my mind on the order here and didn't change a slide, because next I'm going to go to topical, and then I'll wind up with inhalation. So again, very quickly on ingestion of the toxin, it, it bioaccumulates in bivalves, so primarily clams and oysters. If you then ingest the contaminated shellfish, you will get ill with this thing called neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. It's called neurotoxic because brevitoxin is a neurotoxin. The good news here is that commercially purchased shellfish is safe to per, uh, buy and consume during a red tide. Again, Kate's organization works with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. They close down the commercial beds at the earliest, earliest signs of red tide. So you're consuming commercially purchased shellfish from red tide free water. One of our concerns is people who recreation, recreationally shellfish. And those folks need to know where it is safe and where it's not. Again, sorry for the acronyms. Florida Department of Aquaculture and Consumer Services, known as FDAX, puts out maps um, to that extent. But people have to know where the information is and where to access it. 
The real kicker about these toxins is people get it kind of confused with bacteria in the, the shellfish, okay? So you can boil, roast, you know, do all kinds of things to shellfish and kill the bacteria. Guess what? These toxins don't, oops, I, I talk with my hands. These toxins don't care. All right, so you can freeze it, you can steam them, you can boil them, you can do whatever you want, and if you consume them, you're gonna still get sick with neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Okay, so important for everyone to know. I get asked a lot about what about fin fish? Uh, can I go fishing during a red tide? Yes, but with two caveats. The first one is the fish should be vigorous and fight you on the hook, should act normal, if you will, and I bet there's fishermen out there and you know exactly what I'm talking about. The other issue is, especially when we have red tide, even if the fish is acting normal, you wanna fillet the fish, throw out the guts, and only eat the meat because if the fish has been through red tide waters, the toxin accumulates in the guts of the fish. Now again, in our, our, our um, US society, we tend to commonly fillet our fish, but there are cultures who eat whole fish stew. So it's important for those uh, cultural folks to know that y you need to throw out the guts, you need to I think I said it three times. You need to throw out the guts, okay? Um, entrails is another good word. All right, and I, we do know that one of the studies we did that there is an uptick in emergency room visits during a red tide for gastrointestinal illness. And we don't exactly know, uh, this was a, a blinded study, if you will. We never talked to the people who reported to the ER, um, but one of our concerns again is could it be recreationally shellfishing uh, folks or could it be that they didn't clean their fish correctly? We simply don't know. We just know there's enough there to, to be concerned. Okay, this is probably one that frustrates me the most because we have the, probably the least science on it. I get asked a lot, well, what about swimming during a red tide? Is it okay to swim? And to date, there have no, been no topical or dermal studies. How many people get a skin rash after being in red tide waters? Is it one in 100? Is it one in 10,000? We simply don't know. Um, I've had a lot of anecdotal reports over the years. I suspect Kate has. My colleague at Department of Health certainly has. Um, but we don't know exactly what that rate is. Um, I would love to get some epidemiology studies so that we could document what the risk is. And meanwhile, we go with the precautionary principle, which is, you know, if you're that kind of person who has to use special soaps, special lotions, if you start to feel itchy, get out of the water, rinse off as quickly as you can with, with fresh water. And then the other thing I like to say is avoid contact with dead fish. And we as adults in the audience probably aren't too likely to go cruising down the beach and pick up dead fish, but get a little four-year-old on the beach and they just love doing that. Well, dead and decaying fish has a bacterial load in it. We don't know what it is. So again, precautionary principle, let's just stay away from it. Okay, so I was uh, moving on to inhalation. I was fortunate to be a part of a really incredible uh, research group. We were funded for 11 years by uh, NIH to study the inhalation impacts from red tide. And these are the institutions that were on this uh, project with me. And you can see they came from Cincinnati, they came from a Loveless Respiratory Research Institute, our aerosol experts from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and twice a year for 10 years, they came to Sarasota on Siesta Key Beach and worked with me to look at the inhalation impacts. 
Okay, I'm, I like to point this out because prior to this research group starting, the public health message was, oh yeah, the toxins might cause respiratory irritation. And if you leave the beach, if you're uncomfortable, leave the beach and you'll be okay. I think in the next few minutes, I'm going to convince you that there are subpopulations of people, and I suspect I'm preaching to the choir here of people who experienced the aerosols during this red tide that had more than a, a temporary respiratory irritation. <clears throat> okay, so we started out with looking at healthy people and we used the lifeguards of Sarasota County in 2001 and 2002 and we did a classic occupational study which is we monitored them before they hit their beach in the morning and at the end of their shift, at the end of their eight hours, pre, post, five days in a row, during a red tide with no red tide, so no red tide was our control group. And what we found with them is we could find no changes in their pulmonary function or their breathing, and they had upper airway symptoms only. So again, eye tearing, nasal congestion, um, scratchy throat, but nothing such as shortness of breath and wheezing. Okay, then we looked at a population of people who had asthma. And you say, why did you pick asthma? Well, two reasons, well, one main reason is we had an animal model. A colleague, Dr. Bill Abraham over at Mount Sinai Medical Center had a group of very well taken care of asthmatic sheep. So the sheep were um, given aerosolized brevitoxin so that we had some idea what the human response was going to be. And in a nutshell, I kind of hate this one slide is summing up 10 years of my life here, okay? So toxins are definitely a trigger for asthma. Uh, about 10% of the U.S. population has diagnosed asthma, and so 10% of the people here will be greatly affected during a red tide. And what we found with those people as after just a one-hour walk on the beach, we could measure a change in their pulmonary function and in their upper and lower airway symptoms, okay, and then we followed them for five days after that one hour exposure, and they didn't return to baseline until three to five days after that one hour exposure on the beach, okay? The measured amount of brevitoxin in the air is incredibly tiny. Nanograms per cubic meter. Oh, she's like doing the science thing. What's a nanogram? All right, a nanogram is 10, no, to the, one to the minus 10th. So put that decimal point, point zero, 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 and I lost count. That's a nanogram in a cubic meter. So my message is it doesn't take much of this stuff to bother an asthmatic. We also know that the toxins travel at least a mile inland so that the message again, remember, if I leave the beach, I'll be okay. Not necessarily true if I go to an open air restaurant. So some closing thoughts. Um, I get asked a lot, what else needs to be done? Um, we have some other things that I'm greatly concerned about. Again, looking at emergency room visitation, we get increased uptick in respiratory diagnosis codes, but we also get an uptick in pneumonia. Now, it's a toxin, it's a chemical, so why are we getting an uptick in pneumonia? Um, my colleague, Dr. Kathy Walsh at Moat Marine Lab has looked at manatees, and they have an immune system response to brevitoxin and I strongly suspect we do too, and so the pneumonia is a secondary impact. I mentioned the gastrointestinal uptick, and we just had a paper came out recently that also um, 
neuro uh, headache, neuro neuro neurologic impacts. The zeros went and I kind of freaked out. Um, Further studies are needed for chronic exposure, such as during the extended bloom we just had. The very young and the very old haven't been studied. And again, the ER is only one access to medical care. We've questioned doc, uh, walking clinics, doctor's offices, and even an uptick in, say, antihistamine sales in pharmacies, but we don't have any data. Last parting thought, I think the whole panel will agree that sustained observations, both ecosystem observations and human observations, are greatly needed to continue the progress that we have on Red Tide. And with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Rick Stumpf. Thank you, Barb. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kennedy, for, for inviting us here. Um, I probably traveled the farthest, um, but I lived and worked in St. Petersburg for a number of years, and it's great being in Pinellas County. I love it here. I've got friends down in the area, and I, the water normally is beautiful, not like what we're about to see um, here. I'm sure many of you in September and October felt every day you went outside, you're coughing, your eyes watered. You probably thought every beach you went to, it seemed that every beach looked like this, this weird khaki brown. So what I'm going to talk about is what we're working on to, and our forecasts are different than Dr. Weisberg's, we're going after the respiratory problem that Dr. Kirkpatrick talked about, and we're using that by pulling in the phenomenal data that the state's collected and also data that Pinellas County, Pinellas County's collected to get at the detection. You can't forecast it if you don't know where it is. So we're talking about detection methods we've improved, ranging from a wide range. State has uh, um, collected, Dr. Hubbard showed this data. This is in <laughs> July, the state database, and into September. An extraordinary amount of work they have. Um, think about it, all these samples need to be collected, they need to be transported, and they need to be counted. And that takes like half an hour to count a sample. This is every week they're collecting this. So you can see the spread from down in southern Sarasota County up north. My group's been working with satellite data. Some new satellites have come up, much better quality. We've advanced the methods. You normally think a satellite is what you see on Google Maps, red, green, blue. Well, the satellites measure red and orange and yellow and green and near infrared, and we can be very specific about algae. So these same two here, these are images from the same two time from satellite. The dark, the black would be no Karenia, uh, and it goes up to the red is the highest concentration. You can see in the same area, I'll just go back and forth, how it's down in southern Sarasota, very close to shore, and then it, it, it kind of exploded. It grew north and south from clear water down to Naples and also offshore. Uh, but it's also very patchy. Um, you can see areas where um, there's patterns overall. Now, I'll emphasize, we see algae. I can't tell the difference between algae, other algaes in Karenia, but if it's in the Gulf of Mexico at this time, it was Karenia brevis. There was some in Tampa Bay, um, Dr. Hubbard mentioned but we're able to pick up this bloom and, and potentially monitoring it. And in fact, I'll show you a time series here of the growth of the bloom through last summer when it started down in Sarasota, expanded southward, you'll see, as we went on through the time. And then after that southward expansion in, um, in early August, here it starts up, going south, it then started expanding north. The whole idea with this is we have data that we can bring in to enhance the monitoring program. They're, they're collecting data over a whole week. Each one of these is one day's worth of data. So we're potentially getting more data and we're evaluating with theirs so we can start filling that in to get more detail on the beach. And that's really critical to know where it is. Anyone here is a sailor or a boater would obviously appreciate knowing there might be patches that they might want to avoid when they go offshore. But you can see the patchiness. See how it expanded in Pinellas County in early September? and then it stayed in there. And if you know the map of Pinellas, you'll see there's some areas, the area of Reddington Shores down to Madeira Beach, Treasure Island, it just sat in there the whole time. Reached north of Clearwater, and then started moving south. Some of the transport, the modeling, actually showed that sort of transport. Soling coming down. And you'll notice here in October, it disappeared from Sarasota County for a brief time after Michael. Now, this bloom that was sitting up here then slowly moved back south. So a lot of variability and patchiness in the whole system. 
but we're now able to bring that in and guide and potentially guide the state and the county in knowing better where the blooms are overall. We're just about to the end of this, and in this case, the blooms started moving south with the front, strong <coughs> northerly winds like we just had the last two days. Big front came through, terrible thunderstorms, north winds. That's the sort of thing that moves it out of the area, and you can see it moving way south, heading to the Keys. We get into December and mostly dissipated. Another part on this for it is um, we're working on a respiratory forecast, the question of the irritation. Again, your impression was every day it was bad um, outside. Well, Pinellas County started up this amazing effort where they're collecting data every day at all the county beaches. I'm, how many people know that? Do you, an extraordinary data set. And by the way, this was done on this sample here. This is Saturday. They were like, this was not a 95 Monday to Friday job. They were working seven days a week for you. So uh, kudos to Director uh, Hammer Levy's group. This is amazing, the watershed group. Um, we brought in, NOAA's made big advances in the weather models. We now have much higher resolution. And previously, the weather model was, which way is the wind blowing over Florida? We now can go down to the sea breeze. We can capture that, the difference between morning and afternoon. The change in the winds, like the front we had yesterday, the winds changed between the morning and the afternoon. We can forecast those and get it down to that resolution. So if we combine that data from the beach each day with a model, we can do a respiratory forecast. This is a respiratory forecast that would come off of that. What you see is blue would be very low um, respiratory um, irritation, very low likelihood. Red is very high. So that's the pattern. That's a nowcast right now. So the moment you looked at that on a computer or a smartphone, and this is available to you all, that website, you can pull it up on your phone. There's no, there's no red tide now, so the respiratory forecast will show no forecast. Good news. I enjoy the beaches. And if you clicked on any pin, it would actually show for the next, every three hours for the next 36 hours what it is. So you can see in this case, the one at Clearwater Beach, low risk, a moderately low risk, but then a high one in that evening. So if you're looking for a walk in the moonlight on that particular night in the moon on the beach, that would not have been a good idea, but you could have gone out earlier. So big jump forward on that and where you need to go for it. Um, with the nowcast, just to show in the pattern through the day, these are two, two screen captures off, off a phone the same day. In the afternoon, it was very bad all along Pinellas County, and then a big change in the evening to a shift in the wind. So our forecast can let you know it's actually good that evening to go out. That, that's a capability we set up this year with Pinellas County, and we're going to keep that going uh, as well. So we're planning to expand that with FWRI as well with the state, and we're working through that. Um, and just to capture the patchiness, this is what um, the, the nowcast is actually the, 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 the county data from Pinellas County, and you can see how the satellite image compares when you bring those together and how tight that is and how there are some very intense dark patches down in this area. This is right when it was constantly in the Madeira Beach area, but it wasn't north of here, Indian Rocks North. It had finally started to clear out. Um, so it's, it's live now. You can pull it up, havescope.gcoos.org, um, and take a look. Now, a whole other part to this is we need more data, and that's exhausting work to count cells. So how can we possibly get more information and make it easier for the county and the state to at least say, are there cells present? Or are there a lot of cells present? We've developed, we've been working, Dr. Kirkpatrick and I have developed a program combined between the Gulf Coast Observing System and us called the HABSCOPE, Harmful Bloom Microscope. This is a college student lab grade microscope. We've attached an iPod to it and we take a video. That's the idea. So, um, and we're working with a variety of partners to get data, to validate this, to run tests. Uh, Pinellas County Mount Marine Lab. We've been working in Texas, Texas A&M. There's actually a group, a master naturalist program in Texas called the Texas Red Tide Rangers. Um, and we're working with them uh, and in order to test it all around because red tide is all over the, it's all over, it is in Florida, it is in Texas as well. So the concept is there's the water sample, put it, put it on the HAB scope. It can actually go in the field. Um, Capture video, it's a little app on there. It then gets uploaded to a, a computer, a GQ central computer. And then in the wonders here of facial recognition software and all that cool stuff, well, we then take pictures of these and then we track them. And the swimming behavior we talk about, they have an odd swimming. It's like falling, swirling leaves. So we're looking not only at a basic shape, but also the swimming pattern, and we can count them, count the cells. 
and we've been, we've been getting very accurate results. The idea, and so within five minutes of a sample being taken, we can say, we can estimate the number of cells in that place. So we're trying to set this up as a program that involves, we've been working, FWRI has been working with park rangers and, and some of the parks, Fort DeSoto Park. We're trying to set this up with the county. Volunteer, citizen science programs. We're trying to build this to a point where we can reliably do this where the videos are of high quality consistently. And if we have that, we can then get these samples, um, get the water, upload it, the video, capture it, map it, and forecast it. And so, so then you can get to a point, um, yesterday morning, thunderstorms came through, very nasty ones. I don't know, people here walk on the beach in the morning? You normally look at the radar and the weather beforehand, right? Yeah, so you look at the weather and there might be thunderstorms. Okay, let's look at the radar. Oh, I'm gonna wait, I'm not gonna walk at eight o'clock because I'll get hit by lightning yesterday. So you waited till 10 o'clock or you've, you passed on the day. We're trying, the goal is to do the same thing here and so it's no longer red tide is everywhere and I'm gonna feel miserable when I go outside. It's, you can go out at each time and each day. And this is, the goal we're trying to achieve this is literally every beach every day for a forecast. That's what we're trying to, to, to accomplish on this. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn over to Brittany. Good evening, everyone. Well, they talk about all the small stuff, so now I'm going to talk about the big stuff, the fish. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you guys about a recent, really kind of small little project, but it's, I'll expand on it here in a little bit, about the recent impacts on the nearshore reefs that we have out here. Oh, that's right, it's down there. <laughs> okay. Um, so reef monitoring, just so you guys know who we are, because you've probably never heard of us. We're very small. Um, we're a little nonprofit, and our board members include various levels of stakeholders in the fisheries and the conservation in this area. <clears throat> we were founded in 2005, actually in the wake of that disastrous red tide. Um, we, our initial mission was to train the divers, the sport divers who go out there all the time and said, hey, these guys are going out there all the time. Why don't we train them to do fish counts? They send us the data. They still get to go diving. It's a win-win. Um, and we can have these citizen scientists all out there all the time getting this data for us. So we're based out of Clearwater, Florida. We completely rely on grant funding and community funding. Um, we have been funded recently from the Lightning Foundation and we have been awarded grants through FWC and through um, Clearwater Marine Aquarium. We're active in the community, we train the divers, we do reef cleanups and we've actually recently done one on Pier 60, we do that a couple times. Um, we also have gotten involved in lionfish derbies. I know it's not why we're here, but I just want to throw that out there. Um, and most importantly, we work really closely with St. Petersburg College. We um, are basically based out of our homes, so they provide a lab space for us, and they provide free field hands. <laughs> so students can experience um, doing all this science with us. So the reason that we're all here tonight is obviously this little dinoflage there on the bottom. And we, in the response to the red tide starting in South Florida, we actually asked for emergency funding from Clearwater Marine Aquarium to go out and start monitoring the fish in two reefs that are near shore. The, so the two sites that we chose were Clearwater Artificial Reef and then there's a nearby natural ledge. And these were chosen because they're comparable in depth, distance um, from shore. We have many, many years of background data and baseline ecology data that we can use for comparisons, and they're close to shore, so they're pretty easy access, pretty comparable. So we went out two times a month, um, starting in September and through the end of December, and two teams go down on the reef, they swim around, they count the fish, but it's a little more technical than that. <laughs> so we have a reel, it's 50 meters long, we count the fish and the invertebrates on a meter of either side of that transect, so it basically creates a 100 square meter transect that we're counting. Um, and everything is recorded and um, it's written down, which is what recorded is. Anyways, uh, <laughs> sorry guys. Um, the third part of the project was to actually take red tide samples um, in those nice little brown bottles and send them down to FWC in St. Pete for their red tide monitoring program. So this is a photo taken from the natural ledge. 
Um, you can see there's a lot of growth on it, along with the background photo on my slides is from that same natural ledge. And then this is a picture that we took directly after the red tide moved into the area. Now the differences here, the first obvious difference is the one on the left was taken by a professional and the one on the right was taken by me. Um, but what I really want to point out biologically is you can notice in the before photo, if you will, there's soft corals, tunicates, um, all the limestone is covered. But on the right, you can see there are no soft corals and there are exposed areas of limestone. So that's the main difference is there. So the, the invertebrates got hit pretty hard as well. Um, these are some other photos that we took. Again, this is directly after um, we went out there and we're like, oh, I guess red tide moved in because <laughs> all the bivalves, there were lots of freshly dead bivalves, even the pen shells that usually live in the sand, they were up on the surface and cleaned out the sponges, those two photos on the right, the one on the top right has some sort of weird growth on it. And then other ones, such as the one on the bottom right, look like they're basically decaying and rotting away. Now, conveniently, everyone else has also showed these maps, so you guys already know what we're looking at here. Mine are different, though. Mine are special. They have a yellow arrow on them to point to you where our <laughs> reefs are. <laughs> so as you can see in early July, or basically it's the summary of the month of July, it was mostly in South Florida. And then partway through August, um, it started to move closer, but I will have you know that we are still in the gray there on that dot. But sometime during September, obviously it went from being a background to a medium to high levels, and then it continued on through October. Okay, so let's do some really fun graphs. So what we're looking at here is um, the 20 surveys that we took prior to the red tide bloom moving into our exact area, and then 10 surveys after it moved in. And that nice dark line is the average number. So comparison, the artificial before and after, the number of fish, which is the, the fish abundance out there, actually really didn't change that much, which is kind of interesting. But on the natural reef, you can see there was a decline in the number of, the, the number of fish out there. We can actually zoom in on our timeline. Um, so you can see early September we went out, and then somewhere in here is when the balloon moved in. We can actually pinpoint it because we know when we were out there. It was somewhere between the 8th and the uh, 22nd of September was when the balloon moved directly into our study area. And you can see it kind of leveled off and is, is moving back and forth. Now, if we look at the number of species, it looks the same, but it's different. <clears throat> number of species on the reefs, the diversity of the fish, you can, again, we're comparing that dark line is the, the average number. And you can see that both sites, the average um, number dropped off of the different species of fish out there. And yet again, we can zoom in to this little area and pinpoint exactly when that happened. Now, I do want to point out that these look very bleak, <laughs> but something I want to remind you guys is that it is winter, so there's not maybe a lot of fish out there anyway, so we would need an entire year to kind of see where we're going with this. Conveniently, we're still doing that. Um, we actually recently acquired more funding from the Lightning Foundation and Clearwater Marine Aquarium to continue this project, but we added a little really fun element to it. These funny looking things that hang out under the water, those are light traps. So that picture on the left is a trap. It's made of basically buckets, and there is a battery-powered light inside. So we go and we set these traps out um, during the new moon, because that's when it's nice and dark, and they attract larval fish. So as the fish are coming in to recruit to the reefs, we can trap them and see what's out there. Um, we've actually done this in the past before, so we have two to three years of baseline recruitment data, and what we're gonna look at is the abundance and diversity in the larvae, and this could maybe show us possible recovery by monitoring the changes in the recruitment over time on these reefs. And I would like to thank all of our funding sources, Fish and Wildlife, for continuing to take all of our samples, <laughs> and the divers in the right-hand column for going out with us in gross, nasty red tide water. Thank you. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for a few questions at this time. So if you raise your hand, we have some staff that are out there with microphones and they will, if you raise your hand up high, I'll find you. You have a question? Right here. Mm -hmm. um, this is for Dr. Uh, Kirkpatrick. Can you tell us what the symptoms are for NTP? NSP? Physical. 
Yeah, so it's, um, I'm going to be a little indelicate here, GI illness, so either vomiting or diarrhea. But the key thing is because it's a neurotoxin, you get reversal of hot and cold. So you'll get tingling in your extremities. And if I pick up this glass of ice water, it'll feel warm to me instead of cold. That's right. Now, we, we do think, good point, because we think it's grossly underreported and that because people can get a mild case, they do just think, mm, didn't sit so well last night. Um, and even if the physician doesn't take a good history, the physician can also misdiagnose it as food poisoning. Uh, what does the international science data say about red tide? Are you cooperating with, for example, in Japan, a quick internet search will show you that Japan is no stranger to red tide. Haven't heard anything about any comparable studies or cooperation with other countries that have red tide. Thank you. Oh, um, yes, we all, uh, so there is, an international harmful algal bloom meeting that meets every other year. I'm gonna guess that the panel here has all presented at the international meeting and um, we interact both, again, by publishing peer-reviewed papers, reading their papers, they read our papers, and then going to these conferences and talking to each other. The real kicker is different organisms, different toxins, and different effects. So we try to learn from each other, but it, it's not a one plus one that what works in Japan is going to work in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Daryl. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Um, my question is, will this, public, will this presentation, I know it's being streamed live, but will it be available for publication after tonight? Yes, it will. Yes. What exactly feeds the red tide? I, I follow Captains for Clean Water, and um, I'm hearing a lot of different things, and just what is their food source? So all algae uh, require nutrients. And when the blooms initiate, they initiate offshore in the presence of oceanic nutrients. As they move onshore, um, then they can be exposed to a number of different nutrient sources. That includes those oceanic nutrients, um, but it also includes land-based nutrients that can occur as part of runoff, as part of natural processes, um, as cells like Carinia brevis and other algae, um, as they age or as they die, they then release the nutrients that are within the cell and other cells can use that. Um, that can be can called recycling or regeneration. Um, so these all can be different sources. And if you think about a bloom, um, especially this past one that was as spatially extensive as it was and lasted as long as it did, um, that bloom is using a number of different nutrient sources, probably at different times <coughs> to sustain the growth. Um, so that's one of the primary things that feeds the bloom. So just to add a little bit, um, if we stopped agriculture in the state of Florida tomorrow, you might still get a red tide bloom next year. And so um, the sources offshore where they initiate are different than the sources along the coastline. And we really don't know exactly what the impact of land drainage is to a red tide. So that, that's still a research question. Lise, this gentleman over here. A question for Dr. Hubbard, or and Dr. Weisberg may want to chime in as well. And this is an add-on question to the question that was just asked. Can you in, uh, touch on how dust from the region of the Saharan Desert in Africa affects the bloom in the Gulf of Mexico? 
Yeah, I can go through that sequence again. Um, so the dust that makes it over to the Gulf of Mexico, um, and you can often see that, especially uh, a little bit to the south, we, we can see a little bit of haze in the air, and you end up getting really, really great sunsets. Um, when that dust is deposited, there are algae out in the ocean, um, and there may be something limiting their growth, and in some cases that could be iron. So this dust brings iron across with it, and that iron, which is not in the Gulf presently, um, that can then be a new source of it. That iron can then be taken up by the algae that are naturally occurring out in the, the offshore region, and then they can take up um, nitrogen from the air, and about 76% of air is nitrogen, and then convert it into forms like ammonium and, and other types of nutrients, um, nitrogen, that then other types of algae can take up. So that's kind of the process that happens. Um, sometimes the dust hits the eastern or the western Gulf more, um, but it's something that you know, we can see it coming across, and it does happen pretty much every year. Okay. Tier. I guess this question is for either Cade or Brittany, anybody that's spoken today to, to now, but, and I have a list of questions that a senior engineer from where I work asked, you know, sent me to ask them. Here it goes, toxins in the fish that end up dead on the beach. What happens to that toxin? And does it degenerate? And if it degenerates, what it, does it degenerate to? We, well, you want to answer? So in terms of the, the fish cleanup, um, each county handles that a little bit differently. And in this past event especially, um, that was actually one thing that surprised me a little bit was how each county handled it. We heard at the beginning, um, Pinellas County took sort of a unique approach in terms of trying to harvest the fish before it reached the shoreline. Um, once that fish is harvested, though, it does um, end up making it to uh, waste facilities. And so beyond that, we don't know what the fate of toxins is. We'll let you have another one in a minute. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Begay, and I'm the conservation advocate for the Clearwater Audubon Society, and I'm also a full-time wild bird rescuer and for Birds and Helping Hands. And we have been receiving um, unbelievable amounts of starving birds. Starving? Yeah, especially um, cormorants and pelicans, along with other birds. So we were wondering um, if any studies have been done as to the impact this is having on our seabirds, the lack of fish and um, the amount of fish that died during the red tide blooms. And also, how long do you anticipate it might be before the fish populations return back to normal? And what are the species that you feel have been most impacted by the red tide blooms? So, well, in terms of, um, in terms of birds, uh, the birds impact the birds that are impacted, they're definitely one of the hardest hit um, wildlife during these events. Um, there are considerable rehabilitation efforts along the coast um, to try to restore these birds to health so that they can then be re-released. Um, in terms of starvation, with a protracted event like the one that we've just had, it's possible that their normal food source um, or even their normal processes that they might be doing at this time of year, um, they might have been changed <coughs> by that bloom. And so um, I know you also asked about the, the fisheries. And in terms of um, these blooms occur every year, and so the wildlife coexist with the blooms each year. Um, we know that during especially long, severe blooms like the one that we just had, it can take longer for certain fisheries to rebound after that. Um, with some of the long-term monitoring data that we have, we know that in looking at a few key species, a few, a few key species, <laughs> I know I could get that out, um, that they, they generally can recover within three to five years. Um, so again, they coexist, and these blooms have been going on for a long time. 
Um, in terms of which species are most heavily impacted, I think that varies a lot from event to event. Um, in terms of this past event, um, given the timeline, there were a number of different species. I want to say over 100 different uh, species that were actually reported. Um, and there were some regulations that were added um, by FWC to make sure that there were certain fisheries that were only catch and release um, during this event. I'm going to wait on the rest of the questions, but we do have another period of time. And it, why, don't, why doesn't everybody just stand up for a second? We've been sitting down a long time, so let's just all stand up for a second. And I want to introduce, I just saw Commissioner Peters came walking in the door. Stand up. We didn't get to introduce you earlier. I missed you, so thanks for being here. Okay. And we'll have some more questions after our last speaker. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, okay. All right. Yep. Yep. Okay. We got to get back. I just got the word. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sure the speak some of the panelists would be here after if you want to say a couple words to them. So. The next person who's speaking is one of my favorites, and I make no bones about it, and he is our city manager from Indian Rocks Beach, Greg Mims, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about what happens in a city when you have red tide. So with that, round of applause for one of my favorite guys, Greg Mims. Thanks, Cookie. I'll give you the money for that later. <laughs> um, just by show of hands, I'm, I'm interested in... Uh, I'm assuming most of y'all that have been here, you've dealt, you, you went through the red tide that we just went through, but by a show of hands, how many people went through the most recent red tide? Thank you. And the second thing that I ask is by a show of hands, how many people have been through multiple, more than one red tide? Thank you. Well, that's why you're here, and it's important, and we appreciate that you're here. You know, as a city manager, my background's in city planning. I've worked for three other cities in two states, two other states. And I've dealt with hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, red tide actually twice. You know, the, the positive about hurricanes and tornadoes is they come in, they do their thing, and people like me go out and figure out how to clean it up and get back to normal. The frustration that red tide pre pre presented to um, myself, the IRB commission that I work for, but most importantly, the staff, that had to deal with it on the ground uh, was this, you know, when will this end? It was a day in, day out thing. Um, we actually started having discussions in house about red tide in July. That's when we started tracking and having conversations about what was going on down south of us. On August the 8th specifically, we had, I had a staff meeting with a number of public services employees and obviously including our public services director and we talked about what our game plan was. And the real ironic thing about what our game plan was is back in 2015, the city, along with a lot of their cities in multiple states, settled uh, their BP lawsuits. We received about $900,000. And out of that, we spent about $117,000 on a real fancy, my guys love it, uh, John Deere tractor a mechanical beach rake in a Polaris. And I will just, you know, and that's the, the, the strange thing about it is that we, you know, we, we went from, and y'all dealt with this here, I was in, in, in Alabama at the time, dealt with uh, the BP oil spill, and it's just a little unusual or a little strange, whatever word you want to use, that one of the main tools that we used during our uh, recovery from this red tide event was from equipment that BP uh, gave us through a settlement. Um, our first deployment to the beach was around September 20th. And, you know, we internally in City Hall, we decided we were just going to wish away the red tide. We were not going to have it. Uh, we started seeing a handful of fish, and, and we just have a wonderful group of public service employees. You can put on as many gloves as you want. You can use the little 
little pickup tongs, whatever. But this stuff is just, it's not it's not it's not fun to deal with. Uh, eight days after September 20th, I sent the commission an, an email that I was dreading and said that we had a consistent line of dead, and I say marine life because it was more than fish, it was eels and a lot of things that we that we saw down there. And we actually, that's when we actually started using our, our, the tractor, thanks to BP, and the mechanical beach rake. And that's, I tell you, that thing worked like a charm. It's all about the setting and how you operate it, but uh, that's, that's what we use during the peak of the, of the beach. And at, at the same, um, about the same time is, um, it's when contractors for the county, particularly DRC, started doing their, their work uh, with boats and other things. In mid-October, um, my mother, who's 84 years old, was in town. And I walked out on the dock with my dog, Scout. And we live on a bay, and I see a lot of IRB residents here that live close to where we, we all live together. And a mullet jumped out of the water, landed on the dock, and flopped around and died. My dog, through the course of the, I'll be okay in a second, through the course of the whole event, never went back on that dock until the end of November. So from that point on, it was a constant cleanup. And I'm gonna say this two or three times, you'll probably get tired of hearing it. The, the cooperation, the coordination that we have with the county Kelly Levy and her staff, we had all their cell phone numbers. We, if we needed something, they, they answered the phone. They were there. DRC, like another contractor, was the same um, way. One thing I would say, one of the personal note is that I had a family member, I won't name who it is, that suffered from the respiratory part of that. So professionally, personally, you know, I, I dealt with this. We continued our beach cleanup until the end of November. You know, it's like the Groundhog movie, you know, when will this end every day? We had people on the beach seven days a week. The county had people on the water seven days a week. The recap of our, the recap of our response was from mid-September, we had a seven day a week operation. We removed over 60,000 pounds of what I refer to as marine life. Uh, we used, through the cooperation of the county, we had a, access to a 40-yard dumpster that's 22 feet by eight. We went back to look at our records. We emptied that 25 times during the course of this. And then um, $20,000 in overtime and equipment costs. And you know the main thing our citizens wanted, they just wanted it cleaned up. And like I said, that was a seven days a week activity. The lessons that we learned Investing in equipment if you're a beach town is worth every dime. Working with partners like Pinellas County, we developed a plan that was proactive and responsive along the waterways and the Gulf. And of course, we'll now we'll update those plans for uh, you know, the, the future date if this comes again. Looking forward, we, we, look, we look forward to working with our partners to enhance our next response plan Press releases, social media posts by all our partners was and will be important to ensure that the public knows what's going on. And you've heard already tonight about a lot of these new steps that will help, will assist the public in knowing that. Red Tide has been around for hundreds of years, so this will take some time to figure this out. In fact, one of the things I read today, the first documented case in Florida was actually in 1840 where uh, Red Tide was documented in um, the Panhandle area. And lastly, and most importantly, because this is you know, what we do, we respond and plan, plan and respond for a crisis. And I'm kind of giving you the idea of the things that s managers and staff deal with is that I want to thank some people and, and emphasize some folks. I want to thank the governor at the time for allocating money to counties all across Florida to cover much of the cost. The whole Pinellas County team that, you know, always answered the phone, always was there to respond to us. The, prof the professionalism of DRC Incorporated and their subcontractors. The local fishermen, uh, one of the days my mother was in town, walked out, thousands of fish. I called my public services director and said, call our DRC contact. Took her to, took her to lunch. We were gone about two and a half hours, came back. 
it was all gone. And I had neighbors that would look at me and just say, that, you know, that's amazing. And of course I had to admit to them that it was, you know, a contractor for the county, but it's just, this, this, the, the work they did. But the local fishermen were just awesome. The support of the IRB com city commission, like they do with other, th other uh, items that I take care of in the day to day, they let us go and do our thing. And most importantly, or not most importantly, but as importantly, is um, the employees that work for our city. You know, I literally saw an employee get off our tractor in the middle of this, get down smiling, not wearing a mask, not wearing anything. And he's riding, you know, riding on a tractor that's picking all this stuff up. We'll just, we'll just call it that. So, you know, asking him, you know, ask how, how he was doing. This actually was on a Sunday. And he didn't know it, but he had fish, marine stuff, all the way down the back of his back. And they, I'm just telling you, these folks just never blinked. They just, they just, get, they get, they just got the work done. And I do want to emphasize um, Kelly and, and her team at Pinellas County because, you know, our folks work their tails off, but I know the county, they just, they did a great job. Are there things that we've learned that we can do better? Sure, we, you know, you learn that every time you go through an event. But I want to thank you particularly for what you did. And on that note, I'm going to introduce Kelly Hammer Levy, who's going to come up and talk to you about the awesome work that Pinellas County did. Thank you. Okay. Well, go back up there. Thank you. Um, as Greg said, my name is Kelly Hammer Levy, and my day job is working for Pinellas County in the Environmental Management Division, which I truly love every day. Um, but for this event, I served as Incident Commander or Chief of Dead Fish. Um, so I'm going to just uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges of implementing a, a response this large. I'm going to play an excellent video that's going to highlight our operations. Our, our marketing and communications department put that together, which takes up half my presentation. Thank you. And I'm going to go over some of the outcomes from the event. And then I'm going to just offer some, some recommendations for the future. So these maps are just wonderful. Thank you, Kate. And we started um, noticing that, you know, about midsummer there, that red tide was moving north. And it, we knew it was in Sarasota. We knew it had been there for a long time. But all of a sudden, it started to move north. And I was starting to get a little concerned. So I called Dr. Weisberg. And I said, by the way, he's one of my former professors. I graduated there. Um, and said, hey, Bob, what do you see? You know, what do you think is going to happen? What are your models telling you? And he told me, that Kelly Red Tide is coming to Pinellas County and I believe is going to be a significant event. Thank goodness, in concert with that, Kate and her team were offshore collecting samples and that's when we found the an, a Red Tide offshore of Fort DeSoto and that was telling us, okay, now we got to think about something. What is our plan? And I'm, I elevated this in my organization and said, hey guys, you know, here's what's happening. You know, and they said, Kelly, what is our plan? And I said, I don't know. I'm asking you, what is our plan? And they said, well, what have we done in the past? And I'll talk about the 2005-2006 bloom. I said, well, it was kind of a free-for-all. Everybody did their own thing. And we waived the tipping fees at the landfill. Everybody dumped their own fish. And then we started to talk about what a coordinated response might look like. Well, let's talk about it. 35 miles of beach. 40 miles of intercoastal waterway, and that does not include all those little backwater canals. Eight passes and inlets where red tide and the associated dead fish can come in and out. Tampa Bay, what happens if the red tide gets up into Tampa Bay? We had an ongoing beach renourishment project that ran the entire length of our beach, a $52 million project. It was sea turtle nesting season. And we have to protect those natural resources. And frankly, we're not even allowed out on the beach to clean up those dead fish until the monitors have cleared it and said it's OK. We have the public health impacts. You heard from Barb. We wanted to not only know how this was going to impact our citizens and our visitors and what we should be telling people, but also we had staff working 15 plus hours a day out there. And how do we protect them? 
And then we have the environment. Obviously, we know, we watched what this red tide did to our environment. We saw the fish, we saw our marine mammals, we saw our sea turtles, we know what it does. But also, I want to reiterate that point that you heard that we harvested offshore and people ask, well, why did you do that? Well, it, because of a lot of these challenges, but also because the dead fish that in and of themselves are a problem. They have nutrients in themselves that help to feed the algae and the bacteria and viruses that might be associated with that. And we wanted to protect people as much as we could. Red tide so arrived off our coast in early September, but thanks to the efforts of Pinellas County and our municipal partners, life did not stop in our coastal communities. Our beaches have remained open. Major events have been held as scheduled. Residents and visitors have enjoyed mostly white, clean beaches. That's because Pinellas County saw what was coming and got ready. Those initial efforts were to contact all of our beach cities and start talking to them about um, where we might stage equipment within their jurisdiction and stage it long term if we needed to, where we might have dumpsters, who would we be coordinating with. With a plan in place, the county secured emergency state funding to implement cleanup efforts. And we set a new goal first to prevent as many dead fish as possible from reaching land and second to collect those that got through as quickly as we could. Our contractor hired local guides and fishermen whose businesses have been hurt by red tide. When it comes to the waterway cleanups it can range from a 18 foot flat bottom skiff john boat to get any of the shallows and around the docks to inshore and offshore shrimp boats working with the nets off the side with the outriggers, just dragging, skimming the surface waters, collecting any of the floaters that are out there. To clean up public shorelines, the county deployed hand crews and beach rakes. We also provided dumpsters where residents and workers quickly disposed of dead fish. The Environmental Management Division within the Public Works Department has done a fabulous job. Uh, Kelly Levy and the rest of the team um, have basically been the drivers behind all of the success we've had and working with the contractor that we have um, and the municipal partners, which without them, we couldn't get this done. They've done a fabulous job. To better track and respond to fish kill reports, staff worked with our GIS team to develop a web-based app for citizens to report large fish kills. We look at the, the Red Tide Inspector app to see if there's any new reports. We prioritize who's gonna go respond to those and put eyes on them prior to dispatching a contractor. Pinellas County Red Tide Response has been a cross-department effort. We have staff go out every morning, make an assessment of the beach conditions uh, relating to whether there are dead fish present, um, if we've got discolored water or aerosols present. Uh, we report to our incident command team in environmental management. Tourism is a $10 billion a year industry in Pinellas County. So it's critical that our visitors have the best experience possible. Pinellas County's proactive approach has kept the emphasis on the beauty of our beaches. I've talked with people all over the state from tourism marketing and everyone's asking me, how did Pinellas County know to do that? Um, what, what were they doing that was so different? Because this, this made big news. Um, it has mitigated so much of what we would have had to deal with from a marketing perspective. So what happens to all the fish and animals that fall victim to red tide? Pinellas County is proud about how we handle our waste here for red tide loads. We have two options for disposal. If the red tide is harvested or collected from offshore, we can take it to our waste to energy facility. If it's collected from beaches, we can bring it here to our landfill. We bury it immediately. That helps mitigate any odors. Through mid-November, Pinellas County had disposed of more than 1,700 tons of red tide related debris. Throughout the response, we've put residents and visitors first. We've helped our beachgoers know which beaches are the best to visit. Reports are posted regularly at pinellascounty.org slash redtide and beachesupdate.com. We've even worked with NOAA and other agencies to develop a tool that uses wind forecasts to predict respiratory irritation at different beaches. I've gone through a lot of red tide outbreaks. This is the worst one we've ever had and this is the best response the county has ever made to helping the beaches out out here. In Pinellas County, we're doing things to keep our beaches beautiful. See, didn't they do a wonderful job and I didn't have to talk?
It's lovely. All right, so let's talk about some of the outcomes. So we had uh, you know, a couple different sides of, of the program. So we, we had great support from Kate and her team out there monitoring weekly, but we wanted more frequent data. So at the beginning of the event, we were actually sampling seven days a week, and then we cut it back down to five. But we were monitoring starting in mid-August, and then we didn't stop until mid December until we made sure that we were clear and we absolutely saw no more red tide in Pinellas County waters. We collected and analyzed over 965 samples and we reported that information out the very same day, out to the community and out to our partners. We had eight volunteer monitors that worked with us because we're a very small staff, so we couldn't have done it without our volunteers. Obviously, the respiratory forecast tool that you heard about um, made our reporting so much easier and allowed people to decide how they were going to plan and spend their day. And then we had a very strong communication and outreach plan. It was very important for us not only to get the information out through our social media and through our news media who helped us tremendously, but also to respond to emails and, and Facebook messages and things like that so that we could help people um, deal with this on a daily basis. From the cleanup perspective, um, the first notification we received that you know we really needed that contractor out there. We had small little things kind of at the end of August, but on September, in the, right around September 7th is when we heard that you know we, we had a big event and we needed to really deploy our contractor resources. And that didn't end until um, November 21st. We uh, have disposed of over 1,800 tons of dead fish and marine debris within partnership with our solid waste department who you saw in the video, extraordinary group of people. We developed GIS response tools to be more effective in how we were delivering the services, but so also so that citizens could report things to us quickly and we became more effective at what we were doing. We received seven and a half million dollar grant from the state of Florida for those contracted cleanup services. And today, you know, we have a red tide response plan in place. So recommendations. Um, I think you've heard quite a bit from, I'm calling our scientists side of the table, but we're all really scientists, right? So we need to leverage our partnerships. You heard Dr. Weisberg talk about interdisciplinary science, and I want to just reinforce that. I could not have done anything I did without their guidance. Um, constantly when we're out in the field. Sean, who you saw in the video, is my operations manager. Do we have a new satellite image from NOAA? It helped him do his job better. It helped me do my job better. These, these resources are tremendous. And because this science is so diverse, it requires diverse sets of skills, and it requires a diverse team to get it done. There is no one entity who can do this. We need a collaborative network of scientists funded and working together to determine our path forward with regard to red tide. We need to commit funding in both the good times and the bad. I'm not gonna say no thanks to that $7 million, $7.5 million for cleanup, but at the same time when it's sunny out and the water is clear, we need the money because we need to be studying red tide and understanding so that we can respond better in the future. Have your plan ready and be adaptive. As you heard from uh, Greg, every day was a different day. It was like the storm that just kept on giving and you had to be flexible. Communicate early and often. People wanted to know everything. I, at, at times, I kind of felt like a travel agent. When people, should I come? Where should I go? You know, it was, yes, you know, yes. Communicate early and often. And then I have a big ask of everybody here and everybody watching this on YouTube. I'm gonna ask you to make one personal commitment today. One change in your behavior, I don't care what it is, you can choose, but I want you to reduce nutrient pollution because at the end of the day, nutrients feed algae. Yeah, there's a whole lot of other complications, but nutrients feed algae, whether it's in your backyard pond, whether it's in your stream, whether it's in Tampa Bay or it's in our Gulf, nutrients feed algae and we can all do something about that. And so now you're gonna say, Kelly, what can we do about that? Well. Back in the back, we have a whole group of staff, and Anna, and Ryan, and Joey, and Michelle, and Shay are back there to answer any questions you have. Take a brochure. Find something that you can commit to. And if you will do that, go to our Facebook page and tell us about it, and we will highlight you. The challenge is on. And with that, I just want to say a big 
Thank you to Team Red Tide. And with that, I'm going to introduce our next panelist, starting with Kurt Forrester, Business Development Manager with Economic Development. Well, good evening. I want to share with you some of the things that Pinellas County Economic Development has been doing to reach out to the business community in light of red tide. Um, my business card says that I work for Pinellas County Economic Development, but it also says on the other side of it that I'm with the Florida Small Business Development Centers. And we did that at Pinellas County Economic Development for a group of us who are in business assistance, those people who reach out to small business, and I see some of you out there that we've already had those kinds of one-on-one -on -one, uh, resources where we, we've uh, been an assistance center to you. Um, but anyway, so the back of my card says Pinel uh, Florida Small Business Development Centers. We did that because the SBDC is designate, designated as the state's principal provider of business assistance. And so by being both Pinellas County Economic Development and the SBDC, we're able to help more people. We have a lot more resources at our disposal. And so um, this is uh, some impact numbers that the SBDC uh, has, has had in their success over the years that we're a part of at Pinellas County Economic Development. And the SBDC has a reach throughout the state of Florida that is especially good in the event of a disaster. So uh, the state of Florida has uh, designated uh, an emergency bridge loan program, and as part of that emergency bri bridge loan program, if the governor um, uh, declares an emergency of one kind or another, the SBDC is the boots on the ground that reaches out to small businesses because we're already engaged in consulting uh, with, with small businesses. So um, in the case of the, um, the red tide that recently happened, uh, the governor did designate Pinellas County as one of those areas, of course, that was affected by it. And that only really happens with some attention. We, implement, uh, we went out and implemented uh, the state's disaster surveys with small businesses like yours so that we could let the governor know that our businesses are being impacted. Without that survey, the, the governor and, and uh, the folks at uh, the Department of Economic Opportunity don't know that there's a need for assistance. So we, we go out, we meet with you, and, and uh, we implement those surveys to make it possible for those bridge, uh, bridge loan funds to be, be re released. So here, what is the bridge loan? Essentially, it makes it possible for a business to apply for $50,000 uh, interest-free for up to 12 months. And it's designed to bridge that time between when a business might undergo damage from uh, a disaster of one kind or another until they might find either a solution to the problem or other um, disaster resources that, that often come from the Federal Small Business Administration, the SBA. So the state's bridge loan is designed to, to bridge that time in between and provide those funds. Um, we got experienced with it uh, in the prior year with Hurricane Irma in this location. And you can see there, it's a pretty large event where seven and a half million dollars was approved for Hurricane Irma. And as a, a comparison, this red tide event really only uh, was affected uh, people to the tune of $1.89 million being approved for the bridge loan program. So let me show you how that broke down in our local area. Uh, we, we probably had at least 50 or more applications to the bridge loan program, but only 17 of those were we able to work with those business owners to get them to be complete applications that were acceptable to the lenders in the review committee for the bridge loan uh, program. Um, of those 17 that uh, were complete, um, the, only five of those qualified. In other words, uh, they may have been disqualified because their business was too small, they didn't have two employees, 
Uh, they may have been disqualified for some reason, like they weren't in business yet at the time of the event or, or one of those kinds of things. Um, but of those, uh, five of those, five of those 17 qualified and all five did receive approval from the loan review committee. So there was um, a pretty strong response from Pinellas County Economic Development reaching out to businesses. And um, you know, I just wanna encourage you, if you're in the audience and you're a business owner, there is a program here uh, that's got boots on the ground that will help you to fill out that, app that application and help you to get the resources that you need in the event of a disaster. Um, so we're ready for the next time this occurs. Um, hopefully, you know, the next red tide event won't rise to the occasion that this one was, but whether it's a red tide or hurricane or some other type of disaster, um, that same system is in place and your local SBDC, or in our case, Pinellas County Economic Development, is ready and available to assist people to um, open up those uh, state's disaster loan funds. So um, I, I want to, uh, to wrap up, but uh, invite Randy DeShazo from uh, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council to share with you some of the economic impact that, um, what, that uh, was experienced. All right, uh, thank you, Kurt, uh, Mayor Kennedy, Kelly. Ah, sorry, sorry. Um, anyway, so let me go ahead and get started with uh, my presentation. Uh, so I'll be talking tonight about the economic impacts of Florida Red Tide. We'll be taking a broader perspective, not just at uh, the Pinellas area, but the entire state, uh, because the entire state was affected by uh, Red Tide. A uh, brief word from my sponsor. I work for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. We've been around since the early 1960s as a membership organization of the local governments throughout the metropolitan Tampa Bay area. Uh, I run the Economic Impact uh, Studies Program, uh, and uh, just so you see a couple of things that we work on, a lot of environmental stuff, transportation, uh, and lots of uh, other kinds of projects. But tonight I'll be talking about the specific impacts that Red Tide has had on the 12 counties that reported uh, damage from Red Tide uh, and also talk about how it affected the rest of the state. Uh, in terms of job losses, in terms of lost personal income, which is mostly wages, loss, losses to what's called gross county product. That's the same thing as gross domestic product, only county sized. So uh, just to give you a, a couple of ideas of what we're gonna be talking about. The data that I use come from the Business Damage Assessment Survey. Now this is a survey uh, that is uh, self-administered uh, and what it did is it asked business owners about how much uh, your business sales have changed from the previous year uh, that they can attribute to Red Tide. Uh, so there were responses from uh, 12 different counties, you can see them on the list here, uh, and there were only about 246 responses. Uh, it's likely that that's an undercount of who was actually impacted uh, by red tide, but it's what we have to work with. So here you see a map of where those businesses were located. As you can see, they're mostly concentrated in Florida's southwest, uh, not too surprisingly, but there are some spots in elsewhere in the state. But this is also interesting too. This is the survey response rate. And what it tells you is that, um, of course, the impact occurs, but then people take some time to fill out the survey. And those blue bars you see uh, at about mid to late September represent responses from Pinellas County. So there's an impact. Economic development staff is out there getting surveys out to people to ask them to fill it out. And a bunch of business owners did fill it out. So we get a sense of, of just how much participation there was in the survey compared to everybody else. Uh, and so what we do is we added up the impacts that they self-reported, which is about $3 million, 
from uh, the three counties that had reported data. Uh, that's compared to $130.6 $130 million statewide. Again, pretty sure that's underreporting what happened. But what we did is we took the uh, reported losses sales and we ran it through a model. Uh, but what you need to do when you talk about how we uh, assess economic impacts is that you need to think about what the context is for these different kinds of impacts. So if you look uh, off to the right of the screen there, uh, there's a couple of uh, bars that tell you roughly our reporting period for red tide. The red line is change in hotel, motel, and other kinds of uh, accommodation rentals. The blue line is, is how much uh, in monthly sales restaurants uh, have in Pinellas County. Now this is an important distinction. So there's the businesses that are on the coast that are most directly affected by red tide, but, there are, uh, but the only data that I have to work with are countywide. And so what you see from about September or August to uh, October is a pretty steep drop in hotel sales, a little bit of a drop in, in restaurant sales. Um, and before we jump to too many conclusions that that's because of red tide, what you see is that this happens every single year, that there's a drop off uh, in uh, hotel sales. Uh, hotel uh, sales and restaurant sales peak in March, April, uh, not too surprisingly, and then they kind of go through a cycle. Uh, and so what happened is that red tide coincides with an, a pre-existing trend where we start seeing a drop off in business activity for seasonal reasons. So what we have then is a lot of noise to work with that we're trying to get some signal out of. Again, same sort of thing here. The, the really volatile blue bar is change in sales for seafood dealers. You can see they start taking a hit uh, in the August through December. Uh, range, and all of these are, th are relatively interesting um, indicators. But again, we need to separate signal from the noise of uh, the ongoing background activity. So we use a model, an economic model, to help map our way uh, to some answers. Now, as I mentioned, the survey is self-administered. We're fairly secure that uh, in concluding that it's a an underestimate of what actually happened. But we estimate that among the 12 counties, we saw a, an overall decrease of about 632 jobs, a loss of that gross county product of about $72 million and $24 million lost in personal income, that is lost wages. Now, that only tells part of the story uh, because what happens, uh, according to economists, is something called the, the substitution effect. If businesses uh, on the, along the beach are unpleasant to go visit, uh, people will shift their spending somewhere else within Pinellas County. They'll actually go and patronize other businesses so that the net effects across the county are not quite as severe as it uh, might appear to you if you're a business owner on the beach. Uh, and so that, of course, happens throughout the state. Some counties actually benefited from red tide. That is, people who uh, would otherwise come to Pinellas went to Orlando, they went to Miami, they went to uh, even Georgia. Uh, and the, because of the, all of that displaced spending, they created jobs in those other counties. It's a little bit odd, a little bit perverse, but that's what happened. So putting all of these things together, what you see is on the left side, the impact to the 12 directly impacted counties the positive impacts that red tide had on the rest of Florida, uh, and then the sum of all of those impacts together uh, across the entire state, which is again about a loss of about 538 jobs and about $21 million lost in personal income and wages. And key takeaways, uh, we see that the economy is basically bouncing back. Uh, some business owners probably still hurt a little bit from the last year, but um, all of these things also occurred simultaneously with a general cyclical changes in business activities, so it's a little bit hard to, to pick out exactly how much happened and when, 
um, uh, but there are still net losses to the state, even though some counties got ahead uh, because of our misfortune. And that's it. Thank you. We'll take just a few more questions. You all have been wonderful tonight. Does anyone have a question? Here, Terry up front. Right here in front. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I live in Reddington Shores. Yes, ma'am. And um, on November 17th, our water cleared overnight. Okay. Overnight. It was, I lived here 30 years. It was the clearest we've ever seen it. Um, but now, there are no barnacles alive. There's no oysters alive in our bay. There's no pinfish in our bay. There's no squirty things. There's no little sand please. Um, so basically, and, and very few, very, very few um, seabirds, they came back for a day and a few came back and now we have hardly any. So basically, I don't know if anybody's monitoring what's going on, Brittany maybe is the closest, but um, at this point, I would say our bay is in very, very sad situations. And this is after the red tide. Um, and the second question I have, and this would be for anybody on the panel, I'm not sure, is anybody studying the effect of the FWC and their chemicals, not only the FWC, but everybody spraying pesticides in the water. In Reddington Shores, they sprayed it at Boca Ciega Bay, they sprayed it at Travertine Island, they don't hesitate to spray all over. All of our storm drains are going straight into the bays. Okay, let's, let's and when let's chemicals are sprayed, it kills everything. Thank Is you. there anyone on this side who would like to answer that? Kel? In, in response to the first question, um, there will most definitely, and they are already underway, uh, surveys to try to assess the um, impacts that the Red Tide event had on certain wildlife. Um, and so I think that that's something that um, we just saw sort of the natural fluctuations of the county budget. We have natural fluctuations in the environment as well. Um, and so of course we have to look to some of our long-term monitoring <coughs> programs that go back, um, you know, possibly even before the last severe red tide so that we can compare that event to this one. Um, so those studies are already underway and they fit into a lot of our long-term monitoring programs that we have focused on certain fisheries. Um, in terms of the second question, I'm not aware of any uh, direct studies that are looking at the impacts of pesticides on red tide. Um, so I can't comment on that, but I don't know if anyone else. And we will get back to you too on that one. One of the girls from the county. Okay, any other questions? Nick, hi. Is it on? Oh, hello, my name is Yenny. Uh, thank you for your studies and for everything you did in the county fast response. But I have a question. We haven't really talked about any initiatives going forward, are we trying to ban synthetic fertilizer maybe all year round, maybe a little longer than just rainy season? Are we trying to find agriculture when they excessively have runoff? Is there any initiatives for the future? Because it's nice to have a fast response, but if we're not trying to slow it down, what are we really doing? I'm going to have Kelly take a shot at that question. <laughs> That's my girl. It's on, it's on, it's on now. Um, okay, come up here. Come over here. You got that one? All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, I scared myself as much as I scared you. Um, as far as a fertilizer, um, you know, Pinellas County does have um, the strongest fertilizer ordinance in the entire state of Florida. However, after we passed our ordinance, unfortunately, the legislature made some changes that prohibit us from doing it anymore. So, um, we do ban the use of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers from June 1st through September 30th, and the reason for that was we receive about 60% of our annual rainfall during that period of time. And so, obviously, if we're putting 
fertilizer down, when it's pouring down rain, we know where it's gonna end up, right? It's gonna end up in our favorite water body. And so that's why we did it that way. It was based on science. Um, unfortunately now, like I said, with, with the changes in the state laws, uh, local governments have been preempted from doing something similar to what Pinellas County did. I mean, if you go to your favorite lawn and garden store in, um, in June, you will not find any fertilizer on the, on the shelf that has nitrogen or phosphorus in it. You'll find other, other things. You'll find compost products and other things that are good for enriching your soil, but you will not find nitrogen and phosphorus, and that is why. But we're limited in what we can do in the future because of those, those regulatory changes. Um, as far as other future initiatives, we have a host of environmental programs, monitoring, um, education and outreach, and we do it year round all the time. And I would encourage you to visit PinellasCounty.org slash environment or go to our, um, our Facebook page. We are constantly putting out initiatives about what we're doing, about what our partners are doing, and how we can share that information. But I also have to get back to the main message is that clean water starts with everybody in this room, including myself. And so if we want to take charge of that, then each of us have to make that personal commitment that I asked you to take earlier. Thank you, Kelly. Another question. Uh, first of all, thanks for all the participants. I think it's really great what you guys have put on here. Our community is located on you know, Bogosiega Bay on the intercoastal. It's um, the Sun Island Association, Bay Island community. And our residents, you know, certainly were impacted pretty hard by the red tide. The question I have is when you talk about nutrients, what is the impact of the city of St. Petersburg releasing hundreds of thousands of gallons of partially treated and sometimes raw sewage into Bogosiega Bay? And is that a source of nutrients that increase the severity of the red tide within our particular community? So that is a source of nutrients that can contribute to the overall nutrient loading in our inshore and coastal regions. Tracking those sorts of releases, um, those sorts of nutrients from their source all the way to red tide is incredibly challenging. Um, so you know, I know that they will increase those near shore nutrients, but then making that connection. Um, there have been some studies in the past that have tried to use certain tracers um, like isotopes to be able to look at the transformation of nitrogen as it moves from a near shore environment um, out to the ocean. These environments are very dynamic. They're changing a lot over time, over the course of a day, and so it can be difficult to track that. Um, so I think that that's something that is still somewhat of an open question. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to say um, there's so the traditional way of monitoring nutrients, you know, is getting a sample, taking it back to the lab, long lag time, and so on. Um, we're part of a pilot project for some inexpensive nutrient sensors that are real time. Um, they've been tested in Chesapeake Bay. Um, as you might guess, our waters are a little bit different down here. Um, so we're going to be testing them about five locations across the Gulf of Mexico with partners who are already doing nutrient work so we can compare old technology and new technology and hopefully advance the science and the, the knowledge on that. Nick. So let me just add one more, one more thought. Um, you know, EPA has been measuring nutrients in all of our little streams and tributaries forever. There's a lot of nutrient data, but everything is about connectivity. How, how does the nutrient load connect with ecology? How does the nutrient load actually get transported? I've, I've yet to see in all the years I've lived in Florida any interest whatsoever in looking at those issues of connectivity. And so until we start doing that, we can measure all the nutrients we want to measure, but we're not going to understand those connections and what the outcomes really may be. Okay. 
Nick? Yes. I had the same question and I wanted to follow up on it. First of all, as an avid sailor, this topic is very near and dear to my heart and I do uh, the majority of my sailing is in South Pinellas County. And, you know, I can tell you Boca Ciega Bay is a problem. And I think we can assume, and this is for the county folks, that all of the development downtown St. Pete is causing some problems with regard to runoff and the spills. And, and you know, I think we really need to get aggressive on coming, going after the city of St. Pete to repair their sewage system, which is in the toilet, so to speak, and before there's any more of this huge building that's going on downtown, I'm glad to see all this development going on in St. Pete. However, it's directly negatively impacting our quality of life and our economy. And from the county, I would like to know what are your plans to mitigate this problem? Well, uh, you know, there's kind of a separation here in that, you know, Pinellas County is a government entity, and we're kind of like the city for the unincorporated area, okay? And so the city of St. Petersburg is its own government, and the county does not have any type of regulatory authority. We don't tell them what to do, so we're a partner, um, but we're not in that type of, of position. We, we work together. Um, the county does work with the city on a number of initiatives, and uh, one of the things that we are doing right now, and it's because the public wants more information about um, the city's infrastructure plan and how it's, in, how it's uh, influencing water quality, is we are working on a, a new component of the Pinellas County Water Atlas, which is a, a great tool for everyone in the room. You want to know data? We have it all there for you to see. Everything's in the sunshine. Well, we're creating a special page right there that is going to host all the public health related data. And the city's been very actively collecting this data several times a week and posting it out on their website, but it's not getting a lot of FaceTime, if you will. People aren't clicking on it. So we needed to find a way to, to get it out there to more people. And so we're, we're developing this resource so that this information can get out there, so that they can share it more widely, but also so that we can combine it with some of the work that Kate and those folks are doing. And uh, the Department of Health also does monitoring. That's really, it's all in a bunch of places, and we're going to bring it all together so that you can see that picture. And. Um, I would encourage you to um, read the city's infrastructure plan. They have a, a quite a, a number of initiatives going on with regard to how they are going to be upgrading and improving their infrastructure. Um, but mostly what we have is, is a partnership. And, um, and I, I think they are really on uh, working towards um, being in a better place. They understand their challenges and they're putting a lot of resources to it. Um, it's not. The thing about infrastructure is a lot of our pipes under the ground, and that's in your neighborhood, in my neighborhood, in your neighborhood, have been there for a really long time. And infrastructure, let's just say, it's not sexy. You know, when somebody says they need to raise your taxes, you know, $2 per mill or whatever it is, because they need to fix the pipes, eh, there's everybody kind of groans. But if you're going to build a park, Everybody loves it, you know, it's very visible. But our infrastructure is the foundation of our community and we have to care for it, we have to maintain it, we have to have good plans in place for our infrastructure. And so I would like to give the city credit for that, for having put together an infrastructure plan for their wastewater treatment facilities and being diligent about monitoring and putting that data out on their website. They do it several times a week. So I'd encourage you to go there and, and look at it. They, they put it out there for everyone to see it, read their plan, and provide them feedback, because I know they want to hear from you. Well, that comes with effective infrastructure management. And if they implement their plan and, and continue on with their best practices and maintenance and management, um, they will get there. One more question. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Nick, right here. Barbara Walker, Clearwater Audubon Society. Kelly, I want to thank you for everything you do, not just with the red tide issues, but the million other things it seems that we come to you for help with. You've done a tremendous job, and our society recognizes that. 
um, I would like to ask all of you, please, to consider um, further community science projects uh, to collect additional information on the impact to the birds by partnering with the Audubon Society, uh, as well as the rehabilitators in the area, Birds and Helping Hands, Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue. Uh, these organizations are extremely pressed um, and would really uh, benefit from, from a partnership to help the birds. So that's really it. And just thank all of you for, for working on this so hard. Thank you. Thank you. Barb, if I could just say something to you and to Kim sitting next to you. Um, I know in my, my hashtag Team Red Tide, you know, birds and helping hands, and they're all in there because let me tell you, um, I think we encountered our first uh, red tide symptom bird probably around October, and Kim was the first person we called. And in Birds and Helping Hands, we rescued so many birds on the beach, and all we had to do was place a call to Birds and Helping Hands, and they came running. And I know it's an incredibly challenging job. Um, I, as a scientist, see something is going on. I see the progression. The birds got sick, and they got sick for a long time because that source was out there and they were eating those fish. But also then, we're seeing different impacts now, and that does need to be better understood as to, as to, the, to the point of it's an ecosystem. It's not water and circulation, and it's, it's all the pieces and parts together, and we do need to understand that better. Well, we all came to listen and learn, and what a wonderful panelist, group of panelists we have tonight. And I do want to reiterate the fact how critical funding is for this group. They are the best and the brightest, and they're in our county, and we need to let our legislators, federal and state, know that this is where we want our money from this state to go to these people so that we can continue what we're doing because if it wasn't for them, we knew ex the data and the analysis that they gave us kept us on target on what we had to do. So I really appreciate all of them, and I appreciate all of you. We still have so many of you here tonight, and I know it's been a long night, but keep in touch with us, and we will do our best when we have something like this happens again, and we'll, and we'll continue to fight the fight for you. I appreciate you, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. And I have something for all of you, so don't leave the panelists, okay? Thank you. Good night. <laughs>